Let's turn to the book of Daniel this morning. Great to be here at First Baptist Church. Glad to have some folks visiting with us today. It's always a great day at church. We can come and worship together and learn about God and things of God. Our theme for this year, help me here, is I... Let's try that one more time. That wasn't convincing yet to me. The theme is I believe God. Do you really believe God? Hopefully that that is your testimony, not only in, in the verbiage and what you say, but how you live. It doesn't matter really what we say. We can say a lot of things. They can be true or untrue, but our life ought to match our belief, and it will match our belief. If we truly believe God, our lives will show that faith. We started last week to look at a familiar Bible character by the name of Daniel, most famously known for Daniel and the lion's den. And I believe we will get there, but not this morning for sure. I believe there are three different uh, instances in the book of Daniel that shows Daniel's strong belief in his God, Jehovah. Last week, we begin to look at that Daniel chapter 1. We'll start in verse number 1 and read the entire, the entire chapter. In the third year, the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. I mentioned last week briefly how when the Nebuchadnezzar came and besieged and set war against the city of Jerusalem there, that the things, the items that were dedicated to God Almighty, our God, the God we worship, were taken by this pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar, and were used in his worship of a false god. What a travesty that is. But I would submit something, Christian, that any time we use our own temple, the Bible says we're the temple of the Holy Ghost. In the service of ourselves, we are taking the things dedicated to God using in an alternate pagan sense. A travesty then, but a travesty today as well. Verse number 3, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. Children, listen to the description here of these children, in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding, science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. These were no ordinary children. Daniel was no ordinary boy. Daniel was well-equipped and well-favored and skillful and knowledgeable in wisdom. He was a brilliant young man. Brilliant young man. So much so that this other country, the master of the eunuchs, took note of Daniel and these other boys and said, that's someone that we want. That is the, the finest of the children that, that this country has to offer. Daniel was one such boy. Verse 5, and the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat. And of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego." We got that far last week, those first seven verses, just to kind of re remind us what happened. Well, these boys got taken out of the land. They had a different residence, different place to go, and then they tried to change their religion. They changed the boys' names from Daniel and Hananiah and Azariah, uh, Azariah and Mishael, and they gave them names, and each of those names, Daniel and Azariah and Mishael and Hananiah, all reflect Jehovah, the God of the Bible. Uh, Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah means God is gracious. Mishael, who is like God, and Azariah means God helps. And the prince of the eunuchs gave each of these boys a pagan name, a name that coincided and coordinated with one of the gods of Babylon. To Daniel, Belshazzar, Belteshar means Bel protects the king. Hananiah was named Shadrach or of the god Marduk or Aku. Mishael was called Meshach. It's an ancient name for Venus. They worship Venus. And Azariah was called Abednego, means servant of Nebo. What I mentioned last week, we ended last week, was why it was where the men of that country, the prince of the eunuchs, changed the names of these boys, and he thought that he would change their identity. 
He thought that he would change their religion. But you and I know that what's inside will come out. And as we worship God, we don't worship because of a name, but because of a relationship. He thought they were in a religion, but they loved God with their heart and their soul and their mind. And true religion flows from within. It doesn't soak in from without. What's inside always comes out. Look in verse 8. We'll pick up this week. But Daniel, but Daniel, I love those two little words, but. It's like, hold on a second. This story is not going real well so far. These boys were ripped out of their homes and taken away from their families and taken away from the places they could worship the true God. They were stripped of their identity and their names, but, but, it's not over yet. It's not done yet. That wasn't a period right there. It wasn't the end of the story, the end of the account. It continues. Aren't you glad that God adds the buts to the story? But Daniel He said, wait a second, something's going to happen, and it's going to be amazing. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Can you feel him kind of feeling his neck right there? He says, you've asked me something. This doesn't go well. This is on the line. My head is on the line. It's not like he's going to say, bad job, Prince of the eunuchs. You know, 30 days unbeaten with a wet noodle. All right, no. You lose your head. Then said Daniel to Melzar, verse 11, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, prove thy servants. I beseech thee ten days. Let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. At the end of the ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which had eat of the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine which they should drink and gave them pulse. As for these, as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, the king had said he should bring them in. Then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. And Daniel continued even to the first year of King Cyrus. Let's pray this morning. Lord, I thank you for this time we have. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, I ask that we would have the wisdom to be able to hear what you're trying to say to us today. Lord, would your spirit have the liberty to speak to us? Lord, would we respond the way that we need to respond? I'm sure there's some needs this morning. Lord, some things, some needs that only your word can help. I pray that we'd have the heart to hear, the ears to hear, the heart to listen and obey. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to look at this morning, beginning in verse 8. There's a different resonance and a different religion, different name, but then we see in verse number 8 that Daniel had a different resolve, a different resolution. But Daniel purposed in his heart. He had a desire to remain pure. He didn't want to be defiled with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. You see, the the Israelites had some dietary restrictions in their worship of Jehovah. God had said, there are certain things that I will deem to be clean, and certain things that I'll deem to be unclean. Now, we know from the New Testament that now as Christians, those things don't we're not bound by those. But in the Old Testament, Daniel would have been bound if he was going to worship God correctly in, in spirit and in truth. He would have had to abide by those dietary restrictions. 
And so he believed, rightfully so, that if he were to take of this meat that the king was offering and the wine, that he would defile himself before his God. See, even though they changed his name, they hadn't changed who he was. He was the same. He, he, was, he was a devout follower of God. He desired to remain pure and desired to remain right. There are many things in this world that desire to defile you and I as Christians. Come on now, we live in 2020. It, it, it's not like the world's getting any better out there. It's not like, it's not like entertainment's getting better every day. It's not like shows are getting more clean. Come on, right? Help me here. All right, there are many things that want to defile us as Christians. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. He says in 1 Corinthians, What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. There is this principle that, Dave, that Daniel is showing to us, that a principle of purity in our life as we worship God. And Daniel said, listen, there are some things that if I partake of, they're going to hurt. They're going to hurt my relationship with my God. And that is still true today. There are still things that you and I can do that will hurt our relationship with God. See, well, God loves. Yes, he absolutely does, and I am so thankful for it. You say, God forgives. You better believe it. God has so much forgiveness, he can forgive the worst person in the entire universe. God loves and forgives. But once I'm saved, once I've trusted Christ as my Savior, I have a desire to remain pure and a desire to remain faithful to my God. And there are things that I can do that would hurt that walk or, or help that walk. And Daniel said, I purposed in my heart that, that I don't want to defile myself. He made a strong commitment, a commitment that, that, that had him stand up against other people in a strange country, in a strange land with a strange uh, authority figure, all right, when everyone else was basically going with the flow. Do you ever feel like if you take a stand, you'll be the only one doing it? Well, Daniel went to his three friends, basically those, those four guys, the only ones doing it. No one else was standing with them. We get that mindset too, don't we, sometimes? I'm the only one doing this. I'm the only one, God. You, I'm the only one who's faithful for you. Yet Daniel purposed in his heart. And he wanted to remain faithful. And he made this commitment. I had to look up again because we're now to that point where New Year resolutions will be done. The end of February. Think back to January the 1st, January the 2nd. Boy, some of you had high hopes for the year, right? Top five goals, or not top five in any given order, that almost always make the New Year resolution list. I'm written down, trying to remember them. Number one, lose weight this year. In America, that seems to hit, uh, if not the top. Number two, or number two, or some of those order, lose, uh, I'm sorry, save money. That's a great time to, to say that right after Christmas, right? You know, I'm going to save money. And then that first, that first bill comes. No, number one on there was to quit smoking or quit another bad habit. I think a couple other ones. How's it going? I talked before about when I was going to the YMCA, they had what was called, we call them resoluters. All right? They'd come the first couple weeks, and those first couple weeks, they'd make a mess of things. All right, sorry if you were one of those resoluters. They make a mess of things. They leave weights everywhere. They clog up the treadmills. They come on the treadmill, and they knock it to, like, level number 13 for a solid 10 seconds. All right? Boom, they're sweating a, they're sweating a heap, and... And then they stand there and talk the rest of the time. But, uh, but about that time, about this time, you know, re re resoluters usually stop. Now, if you made a resolution and, and you fell off the bandwagon, just a little side note, you can jump back on. All right, if you need to lose weight this year, you can still jump back on the bandwagon, all right? This is not a lose weight sermon, but you can, all right? Don't quit. Don't be a quitter in life. But what I like about Daniel is he wasn't just a New Year resoluter. You see that? He made a commitment he purposed in his heart, and it wasn't going to be just for a week. Now, it ended up being for 10 days he asked for. But he was purposed in the heart to do this thing. He said, listen, you know what? I'll stand against a crowd. I'll do what I believe needs to be done because I love 
my God. You see, when you believe in God, you will resolve things for God. When you believe in God, when you believe in God, you will make resolutions for God. God, I believe in you, so I will not. God, I believe in you, so I will. You see, it's found in the Bible. Joshua said that. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He believed in God, and he made a resolution about that. David said that with Goliath. Is there not a cause? He believed in his God. Who, who should this, uh, this uncircumcised Philistine stand before God? He made a resolution for God. Job and all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. You see, if you believe in God, you can resolve things for God. You want to stand for God? Believe in him first. Believe that he is who he is. He'll do what he says he will do. But then he had different recognition. Verse number 10 and 9 and 10 he goes and he makes this request, and the Bible says in verse number 9, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. See that verse number 9? Favor and tender love. This is what caught me, though. Daniel had not been there long. This is early on in, in this situation. They had three years to make this thing happen. Daniel had just gotten there, and they just started this process, but something had happened, maybe on the journey from Jerusalem, maybe in the brief time that was there, something that God had did that said that between Daniel and the prince of the eunuchs, that God had knit, knit their hearts together in some way, shape, or form. God did this. He had different recognition. He recognized that Daniel was a different young man, and God had done that. He brought favor wonder if he had seen something in Daniel that he was true and right. You know, sometimes we claim to be Christians, but we're not noticed as Christians. I read this story that uh, a light had turned yellow right in front of this man, and so he did the right thing and stopped at the crosswalk. He says, even though I could have beaten the red light by accelerating through the intersection. Are you supposed to stop at yellow, Right? Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, it doesn't mean speed up. I mean, okay. But the tailgating woman behind him was furious and honked her horn, screaming in frustration as she missed her chance to get through the intersection, dropped her cell phone, and dropped her makeup. As she was still in mid-rant, she heard a tap on her window and looked up into the face of a very serious police officer. The officer ordered her to exit her car with her hands up. He took her to the, to the police station where she was searched, fingerprinted, photographed, and placed in a holding cell. After a couple of hours, a policeman approached the cell and opened the door. She was escorted back to the booking desk where she, the arresting officer was waiting with her personal effects. He said, I'm very sorry for this mistake. You see, I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn and, and uh, making an obscene gesture to the man in front of you and cussing a blue streak at him. And I noticed the What Would Jesus Do bumper sticker the Choose Life license plate holder, the Follow Me to Sunday School bumper sticker, and the chrome-plated Christian fish emblem on the trunk, so naturally I assumed that you'd stolen the car. <laughs> Ouch. We could stay there for a minute now, couldn't we? Couldn't, couldn't we stay there for a minute? I wonder if anyone ever assumed you stole a car in that way. You see, the Lord had brought Daniel into some favor with this man, but Daniel had an excellent spirit about him. Daniel was not confused with the others, and this man was willing to risk his life for Daniel and his friends, willing to risk his own head. So Daniel made a request, a different request, and the request was this. He said, listen, he goes, I want you to test our food first of all and, and give us a 10 days, okay, and give us lowly food. Give us beans while everyone else eats dainties, the king's luxuries, the things that will make you nice and plump. I mentioned this last week that in these uh, ancient cultures, if you, were, um, if you were bigger, if you were fluffier, you were considered to be wealthy and the finest things of life. 
And so they would give food and, and feed them in such a way that would make them gain the weight. See, in 2020, we want to lose the weight, but back then they want to gain the weight. And so they gave them the food that, that would do this. And so the, the prince asked, they asked, well, how can you get so fluffy if you're just going to eat this pulse, these beans and water? Everyone knows that. I mean, that sounds like a terrible diet for a moment there. The bean and water diet. Worse than keto, apparently. It was a lowly food. It was food that was common food. And, and, he, and they could have had these dainties. They could have had these things. But he said, test our food. I want to please God while others please themselves. Can you imagine that your job is to eat whatever's around you? You have three years to do this. And in three years, you must weigh more than you do today. And you have access to anything you want to eat. Would you do it? Oh yeah, sign me up. Order to go, we'll, we'll bring it in. Whatever you, whatever you want, just eat it because you have to be, you have to weigh more. I can do it. I can do it. Some of you hit the donuts in the morning at church, right? Sorry, that's my whole box. I got to weigh more in three years. Go to Outback. You know what? Give me a steak. No, nah, give me two steaks. I got to weigh more in three years. Be a great job to have. A great... But Daniel said, no, test our food. He said, test our faith. It's interesting to me that Daniel asked for ten days. Ten days. What can happen in ten days? Truth is, not very much. There's a fitness quote out there that says, um, it takes four weeks for you to notice a change, eight weeks for your friends and family, and 12 weeks, 12 weeks for the whole world to notice. Some validity to that fitness quote. But really, what could really happen in 10 days? Daniel says, give me 10 days. He's putting himself out there. Give me 10 days, and in 10 days, you're going to notice a difference in 10 days. I mean, no doubt in 10 days you could do a couple of little things, and, but, but can you really look that much different in 10 days? Daniel said, try us, prove us, test us. But what he's really saying is this, try, test, and prove my God. This is not about Daniel. You get this? It's not about Daniel. It's about his God whom he believed in. The last of this morning, we see the different result. Challenge accepted. Test was coming down. And you know what happened. They passed. Ten days later, their flesh was fatter. Whatever beans they ate, these were amazing beans. This was a miracle growing the water. At the end of the ten days, it was amazingly different. Verse number 15, they were fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which should eat the portion of the king's meat. So against all these children, we don't know how many there were, but at all of them, Daniel and his three friends were fairer and fatter after 10 days. You see, God smiled. God blessed them, blessing by God. They were noticed by God. I believe God honored them because of their commitment. It was exceedingly abundant blessing, 10 times better. If you look at that end of the verse, in verse number 20, in all matters, they were 10 times better. Interesting, 10 days, 10 times better. But I have a question how do you quantify 10 times smarter? 10 times. Not, listen, the Bible's very specific. Not three times smarter. Not six and a half times smarter. Not 11 times smarter. And it's not just speaking figuratively. They were 10 times more skilled. 10 times. You see that in the Bible? That's what the Bible says. I believe the Bible. 10 times. Were they, could they answer 10 times as many questions as the, as the other children did? Perhaps. Could, could it be that they could speak ten times better the language of the Chaldeans? It was ten times. Everything they did, they were ten times better. Can you imagine those questions coming and these four young men just firing off answers? And like, wow, wow, wow. So much so that the king, Nebuchadnezzar, took notice of these four. He said, wow, this is amazing. This is unbelievable. So much so they were exalted. They were exalted in, in their positions. They were better than every magician and astro astrologer in the whole realm. 
And this whole realm, all these old guys were shown up by these four Hebrew children. I don't know about you, but have you ever encountered an expert in a field and they don't know the answer? Do you want to be shown up by a young boy and he's ten times smarter than you? No wonder later on they want him tossed into the lion's den. They didn't want to be embarrassed by these, by these boys. They were blessed by God. You see, we often want the blessing of God without the obedience to God. We want the blessing of God. We want to be ten times more blessed. We want ten times more blessing in our lives without the obedience to God. See, Daniel was willing to, to say, listen, I want to obey God. I see all those wonderful things, the meat and the wine and the dainties. Perhaps there were donuts and cheesecakes and pecan pies and ribeye steaks. All the wonderful things, an apple pie with ice cream. All, right? all the wonderful things that our eyes would desire, but Daniel said, no, I have to obey God. I can't just do what I feel like or what everyone else is doing. And because of that, he got the blessing of God. We want our kids to turn out and be successful, yet we don't follow God and how we raise them. We want a happy marriage, yet we don't follow the principles that God has given to us. We want a fulfilled life, yet we ignore God's direction and have our own portions and priorities. See, the blessing of God follows obedience to God. I was reading recently in my devotions, in Psalm 144, verse 15, where the Bible says, Happy is that people, that is such a case, yea, happy is that people whose God is is the Lord. You see, when God is our God, we believe God, then we can have His blessing. It takes denying ourselves. It takes looking and making decisions for God. You see, often, often we want to make decisions for ourselves. We don't want to make those hard decisions. We don't want to accept people. I read a story about a man who was walking along a bridge one day. And he saw a man standing on the edge about to jump off. So he ran over and said, he said, stop, don't jump off. The man said, well, why shouldn't I? I said, well, there's so much more to live for in life. Like what? Well, are you religious? He said, yes. I said, me too. Are you a Christian or a Buddhist? A Christian. Me too. Or are you Catholic or Baptist? Well, I'm Baptist. Me too. Are you independent fundamental Baptist or Southern Baptist? Well, I'm independent fundamental Baptist. Well, me too. Are you independent fundamental Baptist who believe in the conventions of, of 1963 or, or of, of 1913? Well, 1913. I said, die, you heretic, and I pushed him off the bridge. <laughs> Sometimes we get so consumed with little things like that. We miss the big picture of what God's doing. We miss that our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. We ignore God's directions. Yet what we need to do, take a simple phrase, like Paul said, like Daniel said, I believe God. Amen. Would you say that with me? I believe God. Do you see it with Daniel? He came to a different place with different people and a different name, different food. He said, I believe God. And because of that, God blessed him differently than everyone else that was there, him and his three friends. You want to be blessed by God? You want that life? I believe God. Not just here, but right here. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what you have given to us. Lord, I wonder if there's someone here today who needs to take that step in faith and belief to you. And I wonder if they're struggling with some resolution, some resolve, Lord. Maybe they're in a spot that they're tempted to ignore your principles, your word. Well, I pray that this morning that they would be challenged by the account of Daniel, the decisions that he made, and they would believe you. Their heads bowed and eyes closed. I wonder if there's someone here this morning who this morning the Lord touched your heart. Maybe you're going through a situation. Maybe there's some pressure from the outside. Maybe there's something no one else knows about. Lord touched your heart. 
I'd love to pray for you this morning. You say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Lord, touch my heart. I want to make that resolution. There's something I'm going through or something the Lord touched my heart about. Would you pray for me this morning? Just slip your hands, slip back down. I'll see it. Amen. Amen. Hands all over. Amen. 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 I wonder if there's someone here this morning who doesn't know that they're on their way to heaven. Maybe they've never trusted Christ as their Savior. But we'd love to open the Bible and show you how you can know for sure. You don't have to go to hell. You can go to heaven. I wonder if this morning as you sit there, you, the Lord's touched your heart, and I'd love to pray for you when I pray for the others. Say, Pastor, would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Slip your hand up, slip it back down, I'll see it. I don't know I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to know. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Just slip it up, I'll see it, amen. Anyone else? See that hand? I don't know I'm on my way to heaven, I see that. Anyone else? Lord, you've seen these hands, those who have been touched by you and those who say they need to you, Lord, this morning. I pray that you'd help them to follow you. Whatever way they need to, Lord, in their heart, in Jesus' name, amen.